Okay, this next segment is about the clot. Clot formation, clot dissolution, antiplatelet versus anticoagulant medications. So the platelet is one of those three formed components that we talked about, the thrombocyte. We talked a little bit about the erythrocyte, and we're gonna talk more, white blood cell, we're gonna talk more, but now it's all about the platelet. So what about it? The platelet is activated and is the first responder when there's gonna be a clot. So what, activate, what activates or aggregates these platelets? Well, there's two sources, potential sources. There's the in, intrinsic and the extrinsic factor. The intrinsic is actually from the endothelial lining itself. So what sorts of circumstances would injure the endothelial lining? Toxins, um, ischemia, um, anything that, uric acid, anything that is gonna be an, an aggregate to the endothelial lining is a potential to um, trigger that platelet to, to aggregate. And then there's also factors that are outside the actual endothelial lining, just any kind of trauma is going to trigger that platelet activation. So the platelet has to be activated. So what sorts of responders come in to, to help this process take place? ADP, thromboxane, there's other sources here, calcium and collagen that also help out. But we're gonna take a look at three of these mechanisms involved because I want you to have kind of a background idea of why we are giving these antiplatelet medications. So it's very important here at the end of this that you understand the distinction between the antiplatelet drug and the anticoagulant drug because their therapeutic effect is completely different as far as physiology goes. So what does ADP do? It helps the platelet aggregate. So when we're giving a drug like Plavix, what we're doing is we're blocking the ADP to the ADP platelet receptor site. So that aggregation or that stickiness can take place. Because that's what platelets do. They get sticky because of all these chemical substances that are released, so they stick together. So as they stick together, that's when these subsequent processes occur. So let's look at another responder when the platelet is aggregated, and that is thromboxane 2, making it sticky. This is part of what induces aggregation along with this other process we're gonna mention. So what is aspirin for? So we're, I'm sure you'd, if you've administered a million aspirins, well maybe not a million, maybe two dozen, in your very short clinical career, and what are you doing? Well, you're providing an antiplatelet drug, very important. But what you're specifically doing is that you're inhibiting the enzyme needed to make thromboxane 2. So the thromboxane 2, if it's never present, then you're not going to have that aggregation or that stickiness of the platelet. And what happens concurrently at the same time as thromboxane is um, being activated and causing these platelets to aggregate, we've got something called GABA2 or GB2B2A. And what GB2B2A does is it helps fill in these gaps in the endothelial lining. So platelets, again, will have kind of a, a reservoir to stick. So the point is not that you know this in such detail, you know, that you explain to your patient how you're blocking the GABA2B2A receptor site, not at all. What's important here is that you're understanding, first of all, that you're giving an antiplatelet medication that's acting in the arterial system to help block this first step in the clotting cascade. So, you know, is a clot formation good? Do we want clots to form? Yes and no is always the answer in nursing, right? There's always going to be that gray area. And that. So we want clot formation to occur because we don't want to bleed out. We don't want to have a little cut on our finger and then lose all our blood because the blood has no ability to stop it. 
And that's what the platelet plug does. It stops that hemorrhaging from taking place. Is that possible? Is, is it possible to have too much of a good thing? Is too much clot formation uh, bad? Absolutely. That's the basis for ischemia secondary to clot formation that will block the flow of blood, and that's transport and ultimately perfusion. Now we're going to talk about the anticoagulant medication. So the other way that you can prevent clots from forming with kind of the primary responder, the first responder being the antiplatelet drugs, aspirin, tiglet, persantine, and then kind of the second responder being the anticoagulant. And with that being said, antiplatelet um, being a first responder are the ones that are not as aggressive, to put it oversimplified, in that it acts on the arterial system so those plugs never form, so those platelet plugs never form, so the platelets never aggregate. Whereas the anticoagulant medications, now we need to get in there and make sure that not only the platelet plugs aren't formed, but it has not already developed into that fibrin clot, which is a lot more difficult to, to manage. And that's when we get to the more aggressive type medications. So in order to understand what we're doing, we need to really take a little bit closer look at the clotting cascade. And again, you don't have to memorize the cascade. You just have to understand the relevance of it in the context of you administering these pretty critical medications. So, as we mentioned before, there's the intrinsic and the extrinsic source of having those platelets begin and be activated and, uh, and begin to aggregate, with the intrinsic being a problem with the endothelial lining itself, and extrinsic meaning some source of trauma that's external to the endothelial lining. And all of this is kind of what we just talked about in terms of what the antiplatelet medications do. The antiplatelet medications never let it get to the common clotting pathway. Up until this point, we've got kind of the two sources of the platelets aggregating, whereas now we're coming into what's called the common clotting pathway. And the common clotting pathway is what we interrupt when we're giving these anticoagulant medications. So after we've gone through all this mishmash here, I could read it to you, but you really don't want me to, we've eventually got prothrombin being converted to thrombin. So when we're giving Coumadin, we're actually interrupting the thrombin from forming. Because Coumadin, to be technical about it, prevents the synthesis of the vitamin K dependent clotting factors. And with vitamin K, you have what's called a prothrombin activator. So without this prothrombin activator, then you're, you're not gonna get the clots to form. So Coumadin interrupts all that. So just so you understand, the thrust of it is that the Coumadin anticoagulant and the heparin anticoagulant work in different places in the common clotting pathway. When we're giving heparin, we're actually interrupting the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin so that fibrin clot could never form with heparin. So what are the differences between Coumadin and heparin? Well, you probably are somewhat familiar with if you're to this point in your education, that Coumadin has a much longer half-life, um, that Coumadin can be given PO, whereas heparin has to be given intravenously or subcutaneously. Um, that Coumadin takes longer for the body to manifest therapeutic levels for that prothrombin or international normalized ratio level to be therapeutic. So the PTINR is what we call it, has to be between two to three. Zero. So that's what the INR does. It helps standardize the way to interpret the prothrombin time. So with the PTINR taking two to three days to represent a therapeutic level, we may need something in the, in the interim.
and your patients with deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary emboli, obviously acute coronary syndromes, we need it now. So that's where heparin comes into play. So heparin has an immediate onset. It also has a very short half-life so that when you turn off your heparin drip, you're gonna be back to therapeutic within 30 to 60 minutes. So it's the good news, bad news. You have to make sure your Coumadin levels are therapeutic or your PTINR values are therapeutic before you can begin to turn off that heparin depending on the reason that you're anticoagulating your patient. So in this common clotting pathway, can you give uh, Coumadin and heparin at the same time? You can because they are interrupting the common clotting pathway in different places. And that's the beautiful thing because you can be therapeutic with your heparinization while we're figuring out how much Coumadin to administer to our patient. What you have down here is, okay, none of it worked. Now we have a fibrin clot formed. What are we gonna do about it? Oh, we're sunk. No, that's what the clot busting medications are for. So one of the points here is that your anticoagulant heparin and Coumadin don't dissolve an existing clot. It facilitates the absorption, the, the body's own ability to dissolve it over time. But if we don't have that time, that's when you go to the clot busting medications, the urokinase and the streptokinase, which actually go in there and break it up. And that's when you'll have your vessel open up. Now that's not without danger. Obviously it's another very high risk medication, those clot buster type medications.